It's just a science project. Silent breed is people! You know, a doctor friend once said the same thing to me. Frankenstein was his name. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! That sounds like something out of science fiction. Please explain to me the scientific nature of the whammy. We live in a spaceship, dear. So? Yes, science! Program complete. Enter when ready. Hello and welcome to episode 260 of Science on Top. Today is Sunday the 16th of April 2017. Happy Easter everyone! I'm Ed Bran and I'm joined by Dr Shane Joseph. Hello. And Joe Benamu. Hi Ed. Hi Shane. Hi Joe. Joe, when we last had you on the show, you were an oncology clinical trial coordinator. But now you've got a new job. Do you want to tell us about that? <laughs> Sure. Yes, I've got a new, exciting new job. So um, I'm still working in oncology trials, but I'm now uh, the team leader for uh, the lung and melanoma trials in um, a large oncology trials group at uh, one of the public hospitals here in Melbourne. Um, very exciting, doing lots of uh, really interesting studies, a lot of immunotherapy, which is the big area for lung and uh, melanoma trials, uh, which we've talked about on the show a number of mm-hmm. times. So it's uh, it's really interesting to actually now be involved in, um, in seeing some of these trials being conducted. Ah, very exciting. So some possible yeah. uh, new treatments on the way, maybe. Well, who knows? <laughs> I will tell. Or or some old treatments being phased out due to revenants, perhaps. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, that's one of the big things I've never forgotten um, at uh, one of the conferences I was at a couple of years ago talking about the importance of negative studies. And, you know, people often think, you know, unless research actually shows that uh, something has a a positive effect, then it's not really worthwhile. Um, But, in fact, one of the things they've done is uh, do a lot of studies which have been able to show that a treatment is not effective and uh, we... Well, as we know, if something is not effective, don't do it. So yeah. it's a way of saving the system money as well. Yeah, that that's that still amazes me that that was such a thing. That you know, the idea that negative studies don't show anything. Was, oh, yeah. absolutely, it's ridiculous. <laughs> it's kind of fundamental to science. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's proved something, yeah. you know, kind of. Mm. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll be talking about some oncology news later on in the show, as well as some superbugs that can survive in space. But first, Shane, we do love talking about exoplanets on this show. And 39 light years away from Earth lies the low mass super Earth known affectionately as GJ1132b. And now a team of astronomers have discovered a thick atmosphere around it, which I think must be the first time we've ever detected an atmosphere around a planet outside our solar system. Um, this is pretty exciting. Yeah, I don't think it's the first time we've detected an atmosphere around a planet. Well, what is cool is that it's the first time we've det- detected a atmosphere around a planet that's about Earth size. Right. Sure. Because I think they have detected, and you call this a super Earth, but it actually isn't really a super Earth because it's only about 1.4 to 1.6 times Earth's mass, if their detections are right. Um, but it's, yeah, so it's probably, as far as I understand anyway, it's the first time they've detected a, a thick atmosphere around a planet which is comparable size to Earth. Yeah. Now, what's cool about this planet is that it's it, it it orbits a dwarf star, so like a, a red dwarf star, which is one of the most common stars in our galaxy. Um, it's a relatively small distance away. I say relatively because it's still thirty nine light years away, which is just unfathomable. Like I actually, before the show, I was talking to my wife about <laughs> light years and how far that means. You know what the speed of light is, and then you know how far away the, the closest star to us is, which is still four light years away. Mm-hmm. And we did the maths. We just did some, you know, did some sort of back of the envelope calculations, and we realised, oh god, <laughs> <laughs> we're never going there. <laughs> the, the distance is just insane. So this is still very far away, but it's close enough that we can think we can study it relatively relatively easily. And how they detected this was um, around this red dwarf star. They know they, they I think they used um, the orb, the uh, observatory uh, an observatory in Chile used um, mm-hmm. their robotic telescopes to sort of... I think they just always pointed at the sky and they noticed that, you know, certain stars had dips in them, which indicates a planet is orbiting. They looked at one specific star, which was this one, and they saw that, yes, there was a very regular dip every 1.6 days. Um, so so this planet has an orbit, a year that lasts 1.6 days. So it's very close to the star and it's going yeah. very, very quickly. Yeah, what's really cool about this is that usually um, if it's that close to the star and it's a red dwarf star, which apparently are very prone to, 
you know, um, sort of very intense bursts of mm. electromagnetic radiation. It's, it was thought that an atmosphere couldn't survive in those conditions. So even though if, if we say that, you know, um, the, the potential for life being very close to a red dwarf star because of the co- because of the coolness of the star, you know, the planet would have to be very close to it. But usually that would mean that in the cases of these red dwarf stars, that any atmosphere that a planet could have would be just shredded off mm-hmm. every time the star has a bit of a tantrum. But in this case, they've noticed that, well, this thing has an atmosphere. And the way they saw that was they saw that at certain wavelengths, there was a, a, a bigger dip. Yeah. In the light. So they th- th- from that, they can conclude, well, there must be a very thick atmosphere around this planet. And they think it probably would be a sort of a Venus-like planet, so extremely hot. Like they, some video I saw said that it was probably about 450 degrees Fahrenheit, which I think is about... 250, uh, I think. So, 250 yeah. centigrade, uh, yeah. Yeah, so it's stupidly hot, like <laughs> nothing that we know could survive there. But... Um, it still bodes well for the potential for other atmospheres around other planets that are close to their red dwarf stars. Yeah. So, yeah. So the the fact that it has that atmosphere, despite being so close, and as you say, subject to all these outbursts of uh, coronal mass ejections and so on, mm. to survive those, one would suggest that it has some sort of a magnetic field to it. Uh, yes. protecting it from the cosmic radiation, which is yeah. very, very cool. Yeah. Um, and when you consider the number of exoplanets that we've found, now more than 3,000, that just means that the likelihood of there being atmospheres around them increases now that we've found the first one. It's like, you know, we first found an exoplanet way back in the early 80s, I think it was, and we didn't find many for a while. We found one here, one there, and then we started to find lots of them with new technology and uh, telescopes. This is a sort of like maybe this is the first exoplanet we find with an atmosphere. In a few years' time, we'll find a few more. Uh, I mean, sorry, Earth-sized planet with a atmosphere. Yeah, yeah. And then we might start finding lots and lots uh, later on as we get the very large telescope and uh, other great big scopes uh, come online in the James Webb. Yeah, I mean, it's also when you know what to look for. You know, yeah. When you know, you know, when you know the set of conditions to actually search for, then I'm sure they'll find many, many more. So. Yeah, sure. Of course, we're, we're fortunate in this case because obviously its transit puts it in a direct line between us and its yeah. star. If it was orbiting yeah. vertically, for want of a better way of describing it, we wouldn't have seen it at all. But we're obviously yeah. fortunate to be able to get this close uh, yeah. measurements. Yeah. And I mean, what I like about this is like the way they've sort of, I mean, there's a bit of supposition here, but they think that, you know, based on the spectra, based on the data, it, po- it possibly is a very hot water world. Which I think is really, I, I, I love the idea of that. Come on, like, Waterworld was hot enough. <laughs> worst movie ever. Oh, that's that's a big call, Joe. Come on, there were worse movies in Waterworld. Not I ruined many. the joke. Oh. I couldn't think of the actor in it, but now it's Kevin Costner and Kevin anyway. Costner. <laughs> and Gene Triple Horn. Yes, Gene Triple Horn. That's right, and some annoying child actor. Yeah, yeah. Who's, who's probably in her twenties now and regrets ever doing it. Joe, you hate the movie so much, you seem to know a lot about it. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> I'm a movie buff. I know, I know a lot about bad movies. <laughs> Let's move on, shall we? Uh, okay, well, Joe, do you want to tell us about Optune, a device that uses electric fields alongside traditional surgery or chemotherapy or radiotherapy uh, in the fight against brain cancer? Because a lot of... Um, this sounds like pseudoscience, but a lot of pseudoscience is usually done instead of the usual yeah. medicine. So, yeah, look, I, and I have to say, my immediate reaction to to this was, no, this 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 looks very. <laughs> uh, that was exactly my immediate reaction. Um, it it just it just so much about it just gives me that icky feeling of you know how how could this possibly be working and there's something else going on here. Um, but uh, it's actually the, the, the findings um, that have been presented thus far are very promising. 
but at the same time, somewhat dubious. Um, so this, this <laughs> promising know, yet dubious. Our favourite kind well, of results. <laughs> on, on face value, they're promising, but when you yeah. go digging a little bit deeper, it's yeah. just it doesn't seem quite all it's it's um, being touted as. So uh, the therapy uh, is called TT fields or tumor treating fields, and it's a type of electromagnetic field therapy uh, which uses low intensity electrical fields to treat cancer. Um, and what patients are asked to do is um, patients have to wear almost like a cap um, with mm-hmm. a, a number of electrodes and they have to wear this for, I think, weeks and weeks at a time. Uh, it's connected to a small generator um, and they, you know, they can go about their lives. I think they wear it for about 18 hours a day. Now, it's not a treatment in isolation. It's uh, it's done in concert with other treatments like chemotherapy, and uh, the 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 findings which were which came out uh, in I think in the last few weeks or so uh, were very very promising. But the history behind this treatment and the previous um, study findings are what make uh, people a little bit uh, I guess less certain about what to think about what what is being claimed here. So as I said. Um, TT fields are low intensity uh, alternating electric fields and um, the, the, the patient has to have their scalp shaved for the entire time that they're, uh, that they're using this, this treatment. And what it does is it interrupts cell division um, and it, it, it's able to selectively uh, interrupt cell division in the cancer cells, not in normal, tumors, no, uh, normal brain cells. Um, so there's not any concern about harming normal brain tissue. And that's where um, the what- first big alarm bell starts ringing for me how does it target just the cancer <laughs> cells and not the visual cells? i'm not asking you as an expert i'm sure that's probably well not no, I mean, it's essentially it's, it's got to do i think it's essentially got to do with cell probably cell repair and the and the, the way the different types of cells behave so for example um if you think about radiotherapy and the way it's delivered differs depending on the type of um cancer cell that's being treated or the area being treated. So, for example, radiotherapy to um, the brain is very different from radiotherapy that's delivered, say, to rectal tissue. Right. And, and a lot of it has got to do with the, the rate of cell replication, how quickly the, the, the cells can actually um, heal in between treatments and how the, uh, the cancer cells versus the normal um, cells uh, are affected by uh, the radiation. And I imagine that this probably is a similar principle. So uh, okay. the, the way it, the way it um, interferes with uh, mitosis um, is probably somehow different in the cancer cells than how I think it's probably because cancer cells divide much more rapidly, mm-hmm. and that's probably how uh, it can have its effect. Okay, um, so that's the- not too beyond the realm of possibility then i apologize no, for interrupting no, 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 no not at all no not at all and in fact a lot a lot of a lot of um you know targeted cancer therapies are you know are uh, you know i suppose hinge on the fact that cancer cells behave differently to normal cells and it's targeting oh. the different cancer cell biology as opposed to normal cell biology and yeah that, that's how we we can make treatments that will harm the um the cancer but protect the normal tissues okay. so yeah. Um, now, I suppose one of the things that I found a bit curious about this treatment is that there's, there's no adjustment for the size or depth of tumour in the brain. So it's kind of very much a one-size-fits-all approach, which is mm-hmm. probably the opposite of every other type of cancer <laughs> therapy these days. But, okay, so be it. Look, if it works, if, if it does what they say it does and it works, then the fact that it differs in that way, I suppose, you know, fair enough. Um but the, but the controversy around this is that there was a negative trial which was published in 2012 where they compared um, TT field therapy to patients who, was, who, were, who were receiving standard of care chemotherapy. Uh, these patients all had progressive glioblastoma multiform, which is the most aggressive um, type of uh, brain tumour. And um, the treatment is only currently being rec- recommended for patients with progressive treat- uh, pro- sorry, progressive cancer. So these are patients who have already failed other therapies. Um, and uh, just going back to, though, the results of this trial, was it was a negative trial. So um, it did not show a benefit over the standard of care chemotherapy. But despite hmm. this... Um, the, the FDA actually gave the treatment, uh, it was approved by, by the FDA, 
but there was also substantial disagreement among the members of the expert panel who made the recommendation for it to be approved. So it was only very narrowly approved. And this was even with the results of a trial being negative. So that was the first thing that just makes me think, oh, you know, this is a little bit concerning. Um, okay. But what then happened is another study uh, has been conductive, conducted and the uh, this study had positive data, which was published in 2014 following an interim analysis. Now, an interim analysis is usually conducted in a trial uh, for a number of reasons, but the primary reason is often uh, for safety. So, for example, um, in a drug trial, there might be a particular concern around, uh, you know, the high levels of toxicity that patients might experience. And the, an interim analysis will be built into the study design, uh, you know, so they'll say, for example, after uh, we've enrolled X number of patients, we will then um, analyze a certain uh, component of the data to determine whether the, uh, you know, whether patients are experiencing an acceptable or unacceptable, unacceptable level of toxicity. And um, the, the data will then be reviewed and uh, a panel, uh, an independent panel will then potentially make the determination. The study can either then continue enrolling patients or if it's shown that the, the, the treatment is either um, not effective or is having a level of toxicity that is too high, the study might then be suspended. Now, in right. this case, um, it was, um, it was uh, an interim analysis was carried out uh, in 2014. And it, in fact, it was found that they were having very positive results. So they were show, they were they were demonstrating that, in fact, patients who were having this um, TT fields therapy were actually demonstrating uh, quite a, a higher level of what they call progression-free survival. Um, progression-free survival is the length of time at which patients are surviving without their can with. They're essentially, it's it's the it's the fact that patients are surviving with their disease, but without the disease getting worse. Okay, um, and this. This was the primary endpoint for this study, so it was the, the it was the main um, finding that they were interested in uh, the study uh, assessing, um, and the the interim analysis showed that these patients were doing very well, and so what this meant was that they felt that patients who were in the other arm, in other words, the ones that were not receiving TT fields therapy, should cross over and should also be receiving TT fields. Now. When the findings were published, there was a lot of criticism about the way the study has been conducted, uh, partly in terms of the design, but also in terms of the findings. Um, the, the first of these is that uh, there was a lack of blinding. This was an open label study. Now, you could argue that there's no reason they couldn't have uh, performed some sort of sham treatment. You, we would have, wow. I think... You'd be and asking people, people to shave their heads and wear a cap for 18 months or something that might not even be doing anything. <laughs> well, that's, that's exactly it. So, so doing yeah. a sham treatment is certainly plausible. In other words, you know, much like, for example, we've heard of in acupuncture studies and so on, mm -hmm. there is a, a, there's the plausibility of the fact that you could create a sham treatment, but it's, again, whether it's ethical, whether it would be mm. acceptable to patients and so on is another matter. So, yeah. but nonetheless, the fact that it's open label does mean that there's a risk of bias because it's not blinded. Um, I read a really interesting paper by uh, Dr. Wolfgang Wick, who's from the neurology clinic at the University of Heidelberg. And he wrote a really interesting piece about this study in the journal Neuro-Oncology. And some of his criticisms of the trial um, were that, uh, first of all, it could be argued that people who were in the field, which, sorry, which were in the arm receiving TT fields would have uh, received a higher level of care. And that would mm -hmm. quite simply have been because being the inter interventional arm, there was more involvement of doctors and various other uh, people involved. They were having, you know, having to wear this thing every day. There would have been a lot of more, a lot more involvement and in care and feedback and so on. So that's that's one aspect of it. And simply the fact that they, they're being um, observed and monitored more closely could potentially, you know, results also in more positive outcomes. Yeah, a sort of a psychosomatic thing as well. If you know that you're having that extra bit of care that other people aren't getting, you sort of will be more positive and have a better overall well-being thing? Even potentially if you're – it's more that if you're being monitored more closely, potentially you're going to be uh, having maybe adverse uh, events are going to be captured uh, earlier, which means that they're treated earlier. You might be going into a hospital more often and that sort of thing, yeah. 
Exactly, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, the, the other thing that he's pointed out is that the mechanism of action of this treatment is unclear. Hmm. Uh, he said, you know, at a cellular level, it is said to disrupt mitosis, but it's unclear how this would work uh, in complex and variable localised tissues and at multiple tissue interfaces, and also in conjunction with chemotherapy and radiotherapy. So how, the, how it actually works is not yet fully established. Uh, I've already talked about the issue of the open-label trial, um, and then the other things that he pointed out is, and this I found quite interesting, is that the trial population itself um, differed from those that you typically see in this type of oncology trial. Um, one of his criticisms was that patients were allowed to have uh, another type of chemotherapy, which is called carmistine. They were allowed to have these wafers implanted. Um, and I suppose this means that there's another uh, factor there in terms of the outcome these patients may have had. Um, and I don't know how it broke down in terms of, you know, which group of patients yeah. might have had this particular treatment or not. Um, the other one that was quite interesting was he noted that the median interval between diagnosis and randomization was 3.8 months. Um, and this indicated that this was a group that was more likely to perform more favorably. Um, what he pointed out was that out of 1,019 patients who were registered, in other words, you can be registered on a trial but not necessarily go on to be randomized. In other words, it can be identified that you are a suitable patient, but you may not then make it to the stage of being randomized to the study because you turn out to be ineligible for other reasons. Sure. And in this case, out of the 1,019 patients who were registered for the study, 82 of those patients experienced progression in the interval between being registered, being sorry, in the interval between being registered and between being randomized. And what this means is that the patients who were not doing well were weeded out of the population early. Mm. So the patients who went to the study were already a group of patients who were potentially more likely to do well, which is mm. quite interesting. Mm. Um, yeah, this gets more complicated but more... With yeah. yeah. It does. And this is what I mean about the fact that at face value, you know, you when you first read through these things, and this is how I felt when I read it, I was like, oh, wow, you know, they've got really some really positive findings here. And, you know, God, that that's really good. And then you start reading a little bit deeper and you think, well, actually, there's a whole lot of factors yeah. here that you need to think about where the findings of a study are not necessarily as black and white and fabulous as they appear to be. It doesn't mean that they didn't have positive findings. It doesn't, you know, or, you know, yes, the findings could yeah. be as good as they say they are. But until you can tease out all of these other factors, you, you have to really sort of say, well, hang on a second here. You know, what are we actually looking at? So so even, for example, when you look at what your primary endpoint is, where in this case it was progression-free survival, where you measure that from is relevant. So, for example, if you measure it from diagnosis, but there's a time lag between registering and then randomizing the patients, and then you exclude those who progress during that time, as I said, you're artificially selecting those who are more likely to perform well. Yeah. Hmm. Um, and then there's also other factors that are important to identify. So there are factors that can affect early progression in um, in these types of brain cancers, such as the patient's age. Um, and there's a particular gene called the MGMT gene, which is, um, a, 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 I have to admit that I, you know, I haven't worked in neuro-oncology um, very much at all, but I know that this particular gene, um, the method, what they call the methylation status of this gene has favorable prognostic, is a favorable prognostic marker. And so if a patient's uh, methylation status is either positive or negative, that can indicate how well they're going to do with a particular type of chemotherapy such as temozolomide. Um, and it's not clear in the breakdown of the study whether, you know, what factors there were in these particular patient groups, whether there was any sort of interesting things there about these particular patients as to why they did better than the yeah, others or not yeah this these sort of study well these um new technologies and new therapies that when they haven't been this, this is going to need a lot more research and some really thorough investigating to get anywhere on it but I, i'm sort of concerned when you get really promising results like this on something that's in such an infancy i can sort of see this is the thing that people are going to write to the fda and lobby their representatives and say we need to get more funding for this we need to get this onto yeah. available to everyone because my sister's got cancer and she needs treatment we need to this is the sort of thing that can snowball so quickly um, oh, when it needs to be done slowly and carefully and thoroughly 
Absolutely. And look, I have to say, I, I, I have sort of glossed over the, the findings that have just come in that, you know, I've really sort of talked more about the interim analysis and so on. And what Dr. Wick had said was that they needed to then wait for the, the findings to come out in mm-hmm. the final um, analysis. And the final analysis showed that the median survival was 21 months for those who were uh, given what's called Optune or the TT Fields Therapy plus chemo versus 16 months for those on chemo alone. So that's 21 months versus 16 months. Now, you've got to remember, survival in patients with GBM is is very low and there's, mm. we've seen very little improvement in that in the, you know, the decades that, have we, that, that, that they've been investigating treatments. But as you say, if patients start lobbying for these kinds of treatments, then there will be a push for it. But what's particularly concerning is that this is a very expensive treatment. And, you know, even if the study findings are very positive and even if they are shown to be, you know, to, to, to really provide a, 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 a strong survival benefit over, you know, uh, when combined with chemotherapy, will patients be able to afford it? You know, it, you know, 21,000 become... US dollars a month. Exactly. So something can become oh, the standard care, but if pa- if patients can't afford it, then what is the value? Well, that's why we have universal health care. Oh, hang on. Uh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> we all Sorry. thought it, and you said it. Oh, uh, yeah, I went there. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm glad, though, that people are taking a very um, sceptical approach to these results and uh, investigating it thoroughly and... Like I say, it's the sort of thing that's going to need many more years of thorough research before we actually know for sure what's going on, how it works, whether it works. But uh, well, especially given that it is such a, a such a different um, type of treatment than the the standard types of cancer therapies that we're used mm. to, which in itself is not a bad thing. It's just that yeah, you you need to really you know get get so ducks in a row as far as. Should- Extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence, and and that's sure. the problem. Yep. You have to, yes, yeah, so, something that's so, you know, left of center or you know whatever you want to call it, from the yep. norm. You have to sort of say, well, is this actually doing anything? And if it, yeah. and if it's you know, okay. and if and if and if it comes to a point where it's one of those treatments where you use, you're using conjunction with more conventional therapies and it has a benefit, then fine, great. But if it's shown to be just basically a placebo, it's a very expensive placebo. A very expensive. Yeah, <laughs> so hot. Yeah. Uh, one to follow, and we'll see where that leads. Uh, well, Shane, do you want to tell us about the uh, superbugs that can survive in outer space, and how are we going to kill them? <laughs> yeah, that's a damn good question. Look, reading this article, I think we've talked about this bacteria before on this show. Um, it's certainly come up in various literature that I've read in the past. What's interesting about it is that it's essentially a strain of a fairly commonly detected soil bacterium um, called Bacillus pumilus. And the strain that is found in every single clean room that NASA has is referred to as SAFR-032. Um, it stands for Spacecraft Assembly Facility. The R is the medium where it's, in which it's cultured. So you can imagine these clean rooms, these NASA clean rooms, where they assemble rovers and things like that, which are supposed to traverse other planets have to be can have to be kept totally sterile yeah. um you know so when you go in there there'd be like there'd be double doors there'd be its own independent sort of cooling and heating systems um when you walk you know when you left and entered you have to sort of have a massive scrub down procedure and everything and the inside would be absolutely immaculate hmm. um every single part that you make there would be sterilized in some way whether it be radiation or whether it be hydrogen peroxide steam or whatever this bacterium persists, and the reason it does is because it forms spores, like a lot of, like pretty much all Bacillus species do. And the spores are designed to, well, not designed, but they they protect the bug from essentially death. Like you, you know, it's like a sort of a survival response. Um, mm. The spores will basically kick, package the DNA into a nice little hard shell that is basically impermeable to everything, um, and then. Once the conditions are favourable, they will germinate and release again. Now, we can kill most things except for this thing. 
but this thing is basically, it seems to be indestructible. Mm. Um, so, which is really, I mean, I find it really cool. I find it kind of scary. Um, well, yeah, we don't want to risk contaminating other planets or anything like that when we're looking and, for yeah. exactly this. We're looking for hardy yeah. life that can survive in extreme conditions. Yeah. If we find it, we need to know, did we bring it or was it already there? So, <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Um, what's apparently really really cool about this is the way it does it like apparently they um I, i've talked about um quorum sensing in the past and how some bacteria can act as multicellular organisms by forming big networks from what I've, i can understand these spores do the same kind of thing they seem to sort of build up layers of cells like they become multicellular and that shields them the dna even further which means that the spores are more likely to survive um excuse me what what that what that mutation that they have is that causes this, I don't know. But all we do know is that NASA is kind of at a, you know, they're kind of, I think they're kind of tearing their hair out about this because yeah. they've got it. Apparently that there is a, um, there is, the, the, there is an office of planetary protection, which is, which was set up to stop this from happening. Um, and obviously they can't. How's that control. working out? <laughs> <laughs> well, to be fair, it's only one bug. Yeah. So, yes, yeah, so far. I mean, the, the problem is they don't know the, if this can be, spread to other bacteria, unrelated bacteria, um, hmm. which doesn't seem to have happened yet. What's what's really cool is that the, what I like about this is they, they actually tested this organism itself. And they said, okay, well, what, what happens when we, you know, so, so we can't kill it on Earth or we can't, it seems to persist on Earth in these sterile rooms. Can What happens when you send a spacecraft off world? Do they survive? Like, would they survive on the surface of Mars where the cosmic radiation is, you know, ridiculous mm -hmm. um, and can kill you know, everything. So they um, they set up this experiment where they released all these sort of pre exposed uh, pre filled cartridges of this bacterium into into basically the stratosphere, like into into the atmosphere. Um, yeah, thirty two kilometers above the Earth's surface. Um, mm. Forty million of the spores in total, and the stratosphere sort of resembles the surface of maybe Mars. Like, so it's cold, it's dry, it's there's radiation galore. So mm -hmm. what they found was when they retrieved these cassettes, these cartridges, 99.9% .9 of these organisms were dead, which sounds great, but that isn't total kill. See, if there's one thing humans are good at, it's killing 99.9% .9 of bacteria. We never seem to be able to get that last 0.01%, don't we? Yeah, exactly. No, you just don't. <laughs> So you know, in real which, which which when you're talking about sterilization for um, you know, an operating theater or you know something close to it, that's fine. But when you're talking about you know potentially putting a couple of bacteria on another planet, it's actually an issue. Yeah, yeah. especially if they're this hardy. You know, like it's yes. one thing if it's one thing if an E. coli hitches a ride underneath a you know like a, a metal panel on say you know Curiosity. And then falls onto the margin surface. It's going to die within seconds, because you know. But this thing probably not. Um, whether it then survives and thrives, who knows? But mutates and comes back <laughs> to kill us all. Well, yeah. <laughs> yes, turns into an actual. Yeah. Anyway, um, so but, but, so in real numbers, if you said they send forty million of these spores into space, and they two hundred two hundred sixty nine of them were able to survive this this process. Um, they looked at the genetics of these organisms and they found um, what's called a SNP, which is a single nucleotide polymorphism in the, in the genes that are, are apparently associated with genetic expression of proteins. So basically, its cellular machinery has been altered slightly and that is enough to help it survive. Well, they think that's enough to have let, to, to have let these organisms survive. They're not sure exactly how this helps them survive, mm. but it does seem to be, you know, it, it, it's it's... It's coincidental enough, you know, it seems to be sort of a cause and effect thing. They're not sure why. So is that maybe something that we can use against them? Can we genetically modify them to not have that uh, well, protection gotta, thing and then try and, I don't know, then, use them to overpopulate and get rid of the well, mutated ones? Yeah. Yeah, probably not. I mean, <laughs> it, yeah. isn't, it isn't that simple because obviously, you know, they, they it's hard enough to get rid of them in the first place to then seed them. With these mm. organisms, yeah, it's probably not. It probably wouldn't work. Okay, short answer. Um, yeah, but basically, you need to figure out a way. Well, first of all, you need to. We need to know: could these organisms pose a threat to any other extraplanetary life, if there is any? 
Um, I mean, what gets what, what I think fascinates me about this is that we have no idea what if we find life on other planets, what kind of life will it be? Will it be DNA based? Probably not, unless the panspermia mm. theory is <laughs> is you know in any way true or converted so evolution. G- yeah, but it would have to be some really specific convergent <laughs> evolution to, to yeah. have, you know, you know what I mean? Like, uh, I mean, yeah, it's possible that there'd be something similar, a similar sort of genetic mechanism, mm. but yeah. would it look like what we have on Earth? Uh, you know, that's... Yeah, that's, we don't that, even know if it would be carbon-based, so yeah. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So, I think, you know, but I think NASA is on the right, they've got the right attitude here, which is we cannot contaminate other worlds with... Our detritus, basically, um, with our you know with our life. Now, this is okay, maybe, and, and this is probably a bit of overkill on a planet like Mars, where we're fairly sure that there's nothing there. But when the probes go to Europa and sample the mm-hmm. water geysers that are coming up, where there might be life, are we potentially going to be in, um, contaminating those those moons with even the slightest bit of bacterial life? And that's a fairly profound question. And I think that you know. That we have to sort of think hard about this and say, well, should we be doing this if we can't guarantee one hundred percent kill rate of any organisms that might be hitching a ride? It's a really, really tough problem. Yeah, yeah. But we'll uh, keep an eye on it and see if they come up with anything else. Mm. All right, Joe. That annoying whine of a mosquito that. Uh, Pisses everyone off. Yeah, that's the yeah. All right, stop that now, Joe. I'm stop. getting, I'm getting snow. God. <laughs> Every time we let you on the show, Joe, you do a sound effect of something annoying. It's a cricket or it's a mosquito. Or, uh. I'm seriously sure now getting flashbacks to summer nights trying to get to sleep while this annoying little. <laughs> oh, it is the worst. Although, although actually, right now, all I can think of is um, a poo when he um, thinks he's a hummingbird. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You once worked 96 hours straight. Oh, yes, it was horrible, I tell you. By the end, I thought I was a hummingbird of some kind. The reason I mentioned the mosquito wine is that could actually be a really important uh, distinguisher to know what species of mosquito you might be dealing with. And when you're trying to get to sleep, that might not be so important. But when you're trying to fight mosquitoes that are carrying a particular uh, pathogen, whether it be a mosquito carrying malaria or another mosquito carrying Zika, it's really important to be able to distinguish which species you're dealing with. And I believe someone has come up with the Shazam for mosquitoes that does just that, Joe. That's exactly right. And it's so cool. (laughs) (laughs) So Dr. Harapriya Mukundarajan from Stanford, um, essentially she was doing some work in her lab um, looking at how to track the sound of mosquitoes. And uh, it occurred to her, along with her mentor, that they could uh, record the sounds of mosquitoes with high-performance microphones and uh, and essentially be able to use the equivalent of Shazam um, in order to identify mosquitoes. Uh, They realised, of course, that nowadays, you know, with mobile phones being so ubiquitous, that if this was something that could be uh, turned into an app of some kind, that they could essentially use uh, the, the, I suppose, almost like a citizen science project. They could use people out and about in the world who are encountering mosquitoes as they go about their day to be able to help them identify uh, the mosquitoes that they are coming across. And of course, as you say, this is really uh, quite important and helpful, particularly where there are outbreaks of disease related to mosquitoes, such as malaria, dengue fever, and so on, to be able to identify accurately which mosquitoes are actually appearing in those populations. Um, interestingly, it uh, you know they it, it's not they don't propose that it would be used in isolation. So, for example, you know, you might have other factors like, uh, you know, two types of mosquitoes that perhaps sound very yeah. similar. Um but they can use other things like the time of day that the mosquito was was heard. So she described an example of where, you know, you might have two very similar sounding mosquitoes, but the one only, um, I think, feeds at night and the other one feeds during the day. So, you know, using other relevant information will help them to be able to further narrow down to the type of mosquito. Now, uh, and I think we, we previously either, uh, you know, when I think, 
when I was on the show or someone else, I remember talking about mosquitoes previously. But with climate change, of course, a lot of these mosquito-borne diseases are going to be, uh, you know, moving into different populations. Mm -hmm. And a tool like this from an epidemiological point of view um, and, you know, to be able to really quickly identify and track where uh, mosquito-borne diseases might be appearing, something like this could really help. Um, so I think it's a little fantastic little uh, invention mm. that they've got there. So it sort of crowdsources uh, the data and you can have, if you have, you know, 100 people all recording this particular type of mosquito mm -hmm. where it isn't normally, you can track that. That is really, really clever. Exactly. Awesome. And as she, as she points out, there are over 3,500 species of mosquitoes. So, you know, narrowing it down could be quite challenging well, and something like this could really help do that. Yeah. I mean, I see a, I see a potential issue here and maybe it's because I, I don't understand how mosquito populations work as well as, say, an entomologist does. But mm -hmm. what if you've got many species in the one area all vying for the same patch of skin. How would it differentiate? Uh, oh, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> well, I suspect that's uh, not a problem that's often going to come up. No, I can't imagine it would it would occur very often, and I, and I imagine mm. certainly also you've got enough people who are capturing that information. You mm -hmm. know, you're not necessarily necessarily going to be looking just at the the result of well we found this one person found that one mosquito but you're going to be compiling that data from you know mm. larger groups of people and, and bringing it all together um so and the other thing is also just in terms of how they capture it the you know the person doesn't need to be sort of standing there observing this mosquito for long periods of time you know they can mm. see a mosquito and they can walk up to it and as the mosquito flies away they just ah, need to okay. capture that brief moment of, of sound yep. of the mosquito you know, flying away. Yeah, yeah. She, she, she did say that you do need to get some, uh, you need to get within five centimetres of a mosquito. Oh, God. Oh, oh, okay. That's... <laughs> I mean, you know, which is fine, except that they actually are, oh, they're, no, they're pretty slow, actually, so I suppose you can get. They're pretty slow. I, yeah. I, I, I know, because I know having snuck up on many a mosquito. In <laughs> they... <laughs> you mosquito hunter, you. Oh, no. Well, look, I, I... I'm Sorry, I mosquitoes love me. I am like yeah. I am mosquitoes every summer. So I have to say, I go about my business trying to, you know, murder as many kill as many as you can. Yeah. I, I, I'm all for mosquito murder. Every <laughs> I, I hate the little things. But, but also, I think that the five centimeter thing is something that maybe will change over time as. For example, phones will get better sensitive microphones and things like that. So it might not be. And if you're using it at night when everything is otherwise quiet and it's that one annoying sound that's bugging you, maybe the five centimeter <laughs> thing isn't as important. No. Yeah. When there is, when there is as much sort of background noise, except for your own enraged screams, you know. Although they do say that they even tested it with a really old flip phone that one of them used in high school and that could accurately okay. uh, detect <laughs> yeah. the mosquito as well. And so. Plus Plus, we know that there's not going to be, you know, as many sounds of crickets to get in the way, so, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, silver lining to everything. <laughs> <laughs> uh, very cool. Um, so, uh, look for that on your app store. Uh, no, I don't know if it's uh, actually, is it? Are they? I think they're actually introducing it themselves. It's not something that the public can just download yeah, yet. Yeah, I think they will. But, uh, <laughs> Look, until, un until they design an app which sends out like a wide la range laser beam that kills every single dead yeah. mosquito in my, in, my in my area. Um, it doesn't have to I'll, be wide beam. Be I'm happy with a narrow specific laser beam that only hits the mosquitoes, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> in theory, it's not too hard. You can use your microphone. You could pinpoint where it is in the room. Um, also, yeah. then you need a laser. Anyway, <laughs> I think it's uh, that's the next step maybe. Shame I would invest in that work so well. <laughs> I, I, I so would. Anyway. All right. I think we're done. If you want any more information about the stories we talked about today, or if you want to get in touch with us, you can check out scienceontop.com slash 260. And there you'll also find our social media information and you can leave a comment. Don't forget scienceontop.com slash donate if you want to help us out financially. Thanks to EJ, who just recently signed up on Patreon. EJ is now a member of the esteemed team of kind souls like Dan Kruger, Brett Henry, Chris Curtin-McGee, Sean McElligot, Richard Sutherland, and Pete Ellinger. And we're very grateful to all of you for your support. And thank you for joining me today, Shane and Joe. No worries, mate. Pleasure. This episode was edited with Playful Whimsy by Marcos Benamu. And thank you, everyone, for listening. 
We'll be back again next week putting science on top of the agenda. Join us then. We talked about marketing a minute ago about like you know the selling of all these kind of things technically. Here's my absolute favorite piece of marketing nonsense, right? About like oh, I'll do it as melodramatically as I can. When? When will we ever win the war on bacteria? <laughs> We're up to 99.9% now. Surely it's only one final push that we can eradicate that last 0.1% of bacteria which is clogging up our kitchen work surfaces at the moment. And I mean the bad bacteria, not the good bacteria. No, there was some sort of propaganda war where we lured LKZI immunitas onto our team. What happens if you pour Dettol into a Yakult? These are like a massive explosion of bad bacteria. And then there's just one good bacteria left at the bottom of the pot going, thank you for saving me. Uh,